Our uh, final speaker and presenter for today is uh, Scott Honeyfield. Since joining Park Hill Smith and Cooper Incorporated in 1982, Mr. Honeyfield has been involved in conception, design, study, and management of numerous major civil, civil engineering projects. In 2000, he became a corporate associate of PSC and in 2007, a firm principal. He currently manages the Amarillo office as vice president. Potable water infrastructure proje projects are his specialty. In the last 15 years, he has made significant contributions to the conception, development, and design of some of the region's historically largest water projects. His duties have included authoring technical memoranda, which have established the groundwork for highly technical water works projects, followed by the design and development of construction documents for these multi-million dollar projects. Always attentive, always attentive to the needs of the client, Mr. Honeyfield fully engages the client in developing a project from conception through commissioning, but continues this interaction throughout the warranty period. This, this he believes, yields significantly better designs, insightful project understanding, and exceptional enduring client relationship. Please uh, join me in welcoming Scott Honeyfield. Thank you. I'd like to think they saved the best for last, but I've actually seen my presentation, so I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, let's get started here. There we go. So you may infer from the title you see here that uh, this is for adult audience only, because uh, we're, we're going to break this down to an anatomy. Uh, but I guarantee you there's, there'll be no, uh, no nudity, uh, no cussing, uh, no unseemly uh, video clips, so uh, rest assured for that. This is a, a, a painting by Remington. I, I really like this painting because it shows a, a single water, water source in the middle of nowhere and uh, people defending that uh, maybe to the death. Uh, let's hope we don't, we don't have to go that far, and I think with, with symposiums just like this is we can bring together people to share ideas and set policy that, that we understand. And I think that's, that's, more, that's important that we understand why those policies came about because then we're more likely to uh, uphold those policies and, and defend them. So the definition of, of, a, uh, of anatomy uh, is the dissection of plant or animal. In this case, we're going to dissect a well. And, uh, and, and look at those parts and pieces that make up a well. Uh, just for grins, I googled anatomy of a well, and this is what you get. Uh, I could stop here. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty basic. It shows you the, the pump, the well, the, the pressure switch, the pressure tank. Uh, very commonly, you'll see that in a house well. But like I say, I'm an engineer, so we're going to get in the we're going to get in the details of, of what it takes to uh, to do a well. Now, I do want to I do want to uh, bring everyone's attention to the fact that there's going to be two slides we get to in here that uh, are prize worthy, and I'll ask the audience whoever's first to uh, to uh, come up with the right answer. The uh, hot lady in the back with with the, with the blue top on, <laughs> there she is. Uh, will uh, will come find you and give you a, give you a gift. So let's start out with how you pay for a well like this. If you're in the public uh, arena, uh, you have the Texas Water Development Board. They give a very good presentation on some of the, some of the programs they have. Uh, TCDP is actually a grant process. Uh, in this area, you can expect to get about $270,000 for, for a grant. Uh, very, uh, it's, those are very uh, challenging because there's a lot of competition for that money. Uh, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation System, uh, Service, has, has, has uh, uh, funding mechanisms out there. Uh, certainly there's uh, a COs or certificates of obligation uh, that a city can use or bonds. Uh, there is also self-funding. As cheap as money has been in the last uh, few years, a lot of uh, cities have been able to self-fund their projects, and that's really actually a pretty good, pretty good deal. On the private side, there's self-funding or got credit, and that's about all there is for, for the funding part of it. So now that you've found your money, let's talk about finding the water. Uh, the cartoon would uh, indicate that you can still douse. Uh, people still do that, believe it or not. Um, 
Sources are Texas Water and Development Board. I know if I'm working in another, another part of the state that I'm not familiar with, that's usually where I start. They tell me where the major minor aquifers far, are, what those reaches are. Uh, TCQ is another uh, fine uh, source for, for that. Water conservation districts. I know we have many water conservation districts here. Very, very good source of, of information. They will actually produce contoured maps that show depth to water, depth of formation, depth to the ba base of the aquifer. Uh, but you have to realize that that is based on the wells that they have within their system to develop those. So if you keep, if you keep digging deeper, no pun intended, uh, local drillers, good, good source of, uh, of, of the specifics of what they have found, what they've experienced in those particular locations. There's also some other techniques that we're gonna look at a little bit deeper here, again, no pun intended here, uh, electromagnetic resistivity testing. We've actually used that to some degree of success in, in the area. Uh, there's also time domain that actually uses the induction side or the amperage side as opposed to the voltage side with the resistivities. And there's a seismoelectric. I've under, I understand from some people I know that have been in this, in this industry a long, long time that the seismoelectric may not be as, as, uh, as good as they tout it to be. So this is an example of electromagnetic resistive, uh, resistivity testing. What I want to point out here is or the takeaway from this slide, is there's not a sea of water underneath us, like some people might think. Uh, it can be very sporadic. It can be non-existent. Uh, what, what we showed here, and it actually, it actually came to fruition, uh, and actually supported what we were thinking we might actually have in this particular location, this is actually in the Panhandle, as a matter of fact, is there were channels, deep channels, that were interconnecting deep pools that we had uh, in this particular area. Uh, but here again, the takeaway from this one is there's not a sea of water underneath us. So our next step would be after, you've, after you think you've found the water, if you're going to spend a lot of money on these wells, and I'll just say this, in the, in the public arena, we're spending between 300000 to over a million dollars for a well. And that's, the, that's drilling the well, putting the casing in, putting a, a, a pump in, uh, and being able to start that pump. That doesn't include the piping, or the, the, the discharge piping, or the power, or roads, or other things like that. It's just the well. Uh, so you can see what kind of dollars you're talking about. So we always suggest before you spend that kind of money, that you find out what you have there. So typically we'll do a test hole, and what they will, they, what they will uh, produce from that is a driller's log that you see right here. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but this last column here is the sand count. So what we look for there is if those are, if the 20s are actually good, that means the entire 20 foot section of drill stem, they encountered sand. That's a good thing, that's what you wanna see. And if you, if you follow that down, it's not 20 all the way down, it gets sporadic, and that means you're hitting some kind of, some kind of formation there that's not probably gonna produce as well. Uh, from that, they will take samples, drill cuttings, you see here. Each one of those little piles represents a five-foot segment of the column pipe as they were progressing that, that drill stem into the well. We, we aggregate those uh, as a composite sample and develop these little bags. Those are shipped off and we get a sieve analysis that's done. Uh, from that, we can, we can then basically do a design for the well. We can determine what size the, the uh, screen needs to be. We can determine what size the gravel pack needs to be, and so forth. The steeper this curve is, the better. What that means is it's more uniform. And you want uniformity. Uh, that, that, that basically tells you that your well can produce more water. Uh-oh, what did I do? Okay, we're back in business. So as with the test hole still open, uh, we do geophysical testing. Uh, they'll show up in a van, much like you see in the, in the uh, photograph. Uh, they will lower a probe in the far right-hand right -hand side. And from that, they can develop some of the geophysical testing. So what you see there is three, three different tests that, they've, that, that were done in this particular case. And you get long sheets with a bunch of squiggly lines on there. We can actually interpret those and from those determine where the water is at, where the better water is at, and where we want to uh, place our screen in order, or in order to construct this well. Some of the geophysical testing that, that is done uh, includes some of these. I won't read them all off, but I will say that the top three here, resistivity, spontaneous potential, and natural gamma, are typically the ones we will, we will use. And that's what was represented in the previous slide. 
But there's also some hybrid ones that you know get into, into acoustics, water temperature, fluid movement. Uh, in your uh, it, that you can you can also do. We rarely use these in in this area. Uh, you may also want to, while the test hole is still open, actually sample uh, that water and test it. Uh, here again, you were talking about spending between three hundred thousand to a million dollars for a municipal well. You want to make sure you're getting good water quality too. Most of the water we, we, uh, we can find in this area is actually potable coming out of the ground. We just need to add a little bit of chlorine to it, satisfies T TCQ's requirements, and we're good to go. Uh, let's see. One story I want to share with you is the uh, sampling and preservation is take duplicate samples. We had spent uh, quite a bit of money to, to do a test hole for a particular entity uh, in, in, the, in this area. And uh, I was a young gun at that time, so I thought, Psh, I only need one sample. And we need to take a gallon, it's a cube shape. Uh, got that to the office, and I had my arms all loaded up, reached for the door to open it, and I dropped it. Luckily, it didn't break. <laughs> but when I got to the office and sat down, it hit me, wow. That would have cost several thousands of dollars for us to go back and do that, and I would have been paying for that. So that's why I say, always take duplicates, keep one in the truck. <laughs> Take one in the office, and then uh, then uh, you you have a little bit of a little bit of saving grace there. A uh, site location is is also very critical on some of these larger wells I'm I'm speaking of. We'll usually uh, allow uh, two acres uh, to be disturbed uh, for them to actually construct this thing. Uh, but in in choosing the location here again, the, the districts are here. Uh, you need to be visiting with those guys about what they have as a requirement uh, for spacing, uh, for withdrawal rates, uh, and also for flow measurements. Uh, if it's on the municipal side, you have some TCQ requirements that you have to, have to comply with in order, in order to uh, construct these wells. Site location, yeah, this made me say, hmm. This is actually in the, uh, in the panhandle. Does anyone know where that's at? He does, but he already has a hat. <laughs> and I won't say who it, I won't say who it is, but this particular location uh, was in an area that at one time would actually flood. Uh, the the area where it could actually contain water has been reworked, and it doesn't contain water anymore. But you can see in the uh, in the slide that the discharge piping is also elevated as, as well. Can you imagine if this well was was built at grade during a time when it would flood? Drilling methods, let's explore a little bit of those. Uh, the two that are in bold, uh, direct rotary and reverse circulation, those are the most common ones that you'll find in this area. Uh, there's, there's others that are listed, I won't read those, but uh, one in particular, the cable tool, that was used by gas and oil uh, back, in the, back in the day in this area and is, is still widely used. So let's explore what the difference between these two, are, these two methods are. In direct rotary, you can see the flow arrows here, maybe not as well, but you actually have clean drilling fluid or drilling mud that's actually pumped down the drill stem. And you're lifting or floating the cuttings from the bottom up the sides of the borehole. Now just think about that. You're actually, you're actually taking the dirty mess that you're, that you're, that you're uh, cutting with that, with, that, with that drill head, and you're passing it up by some of the best formations that you have. What can happen in the worst cases is that you can actually penetrate your drilling mud or your mud cake that's on the walls of your, of your drill hole that's holding that open and push that out in, into the formation. You may never recover that. So the yield of your well can suffer and in some cases I've actually seen it ruin the well. Reverse circulation as the name would imply reverses that flow. So you're actually taking clean mud, which I know sounds a little bit weird. Uh, you're actually running that down between the, the borehole and your drill stem, and you're actually sucking that up. So think about that. You're never putting in contact the cuttings with your, your formation. You're keeping, you're keeping the best stuff up against your formation. We have found in using that particular method that developing the well is much, much less uh, uh, time. Uh, it doesn't take as much time to do it, and that trans translates into saving money for the client. On, the, on larger projects that we have done, we've actually required the contractor to actually use that method and no other.
So after your, after your borehole is done, you're gonna to wanna to put in a, a screen of some type. So this is a prize winner. Of the three that are here, which one do you think can produce the most water or has the least, or has the most open area in it? First one. Far left, right there. Got a guy right up here. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, this, is a, this is a wire wrap screen. This is actually stainless steel. Has the, has the largest open area of all of them. Uh, this one right here is a, a louver uh, or, or a shutter screen. Uh, no, it doesn't come uh, to the job site that polished. They actually polish that up. That's a, uh, whenever I do a, whenever I have a smaller group, I actually uh, will actually take those out and share them with people so they can, they can hold them and, and lift them and look at them. Uh, and if you look really closely, you can see who was taking the picture right there. That was actually me. Uh, this one is, is very, very common. Uh, you see that a lot in the, in the ag wells and in, in certainly in some of the previous, in some of the older wells, uh, is a mill slot casing. You actually take a casing pipe and cut slots in it. It's actually milled in a, mill, in a, in a, in a uh, factory that actually mill that thing, uh, but it's also limited by how thin that slot can be. So if you're in an area that has really fine sands, that may not be your, that may not be your choice. That may not, may, may not be your wisest choice. Uh, if you were to use something like that, where you had, where you couldn't get it fine enough to keep the keep the fines out, you're going to end up with a well that's producing a lot of sand. Uh, this is an unusual one. I've never had a case to use it, but basically you have a screen inside of a screen. So if you're a screen manufacturer, what would you rather sell? <laughs> I can sell you twice as much screen with this one. There is, they actually do have a good point here with this one. Um, Many, te many uh, tests have shown that the amount of gravel pack you need for it to do its job, half of an inch. We can't construct half of an inch conventionally. Uh, about the closest we can get is probably three to four inches of gravel pack in order to be able to get a trimmy pipe down that actually put that gravel where it's supposed to be. What they're doing in this case, uh, this may be an inch annulus. They actually fill that with a man-made aggregate. It's actually ceramic that they fill it with. So what you can technically do in this case is drill a much uh, smaller borehole because you're going to put this right up next to, the, to, your, uh, to your formation, and then you develop that. So potentially it has a, the, the, uh, the, the means of being less expensive. And this one you'll, you'll typically see in, in the environmental world. You, you can see right there there's a rubber gasket that's meant to seal that off so you're only taking water where you want it to come from. So if you have monitoring wells, or you'll see some of this stuff in, in, in house wells. A lot of house wells have plastic. My own house well has, is, has plastic. So why would you want to use one from the other? Well, I asked the question earlier, and this man won a, won a hat from us. Uh, you can see here, mill slot, 6% open area. Another way of saying that is 94% of that is blank. It's blocked off. That shutter and louver, louvered, louvered uh, screen, uh, six to 12%, depending on what the, what the opening is. A wire wrap, look at that, you can get as much as 30% open area in a wire wrap screen. Uh, the pre-pack or munipack, uh, that's the one that had the, they're selling you twice the screen, probably had the, about the same uh, open area as this would. Uh, in situ perforation, very unusual uh, type of, of, uh, of uh, way to construct a well they will actually set off a charge inside the well that drive pistons through the casing. Very unusual. Usually you see that when you have rock formations or something like that. Uh, let's see, and then you have torch slot. That dates back to the very beginning of time when, when we were constructing wells. And you actually use an oxy settling a torch and actually cut slots in your casing, put it in, and probably used a quarter inch gravel between the, between the, between the borehole and the, and, the, and the torch slot. We don't see that used at all anymore. So let's talk about installing the screen. Uh, what you see in this one, it, this right here is a sump, and it's actually stainless steel. That's why it has the color that it does. And the shiny part here is actually the screen you see here. Yes, I did have a talk with the driller about using a four-inch four, four, uh, torpedo level to level a 40-foot section of pipe. Uh, gravel pack, its, its purpose is to keep the formation in its place. In other words, you want to keep the formation out there where it's supposed to be and not inside your well and pumping it and getting, in, getting it into your system. Uh, I mentioned earlier the quarter inch gravel that was used. Uh, we had, and we put a tape measure here next to it so you can see what that looks like. This right here is actually uh, ceramic. 
for ceramic material. Uh, below here is what we typically use in, in, in wells. Uh, it's actually a silica sand. Very uniform in size, very uh, round. Uh, that's what you want. It actually flows more water the rounder it is, which gives credence to this new, the newest product that's out there. It's actually a German-made product. Uh, it's actually glass beads. If you were to look at it in your hand, the, the bigger ones actually look like marbles. But they're very, very round, very hard, very smooth. Their selling point is that they won't support very readily biological growth, and more importantly, as the age, as the, as a uh, well ages, the uh, uh, calcification that you can develop inside your well can also migrate out to the gravel pack. It's easier to acid clean this just because it's so smooth. Uh, you can clean that off uh, much, much easier. These and this and the, and the ceramics are typically de delivered to a site like this uh, in jumbo bags, they call those. Each of those bags weighs a ton. So that you can't steal them very easy. Well development is the most important part of constructing a well. Without good development, uh, you're just not going to get a very good well. Um, its primary purpose is to remo remove the filter cake. Uh, in the process of drilling, you're, you're using a drilling mud and basically you're, you're creating a somewhat impervious membrane between the borehole and the formation itself that keeps that borehole open. And you have to develop that out after the well is, is, is constructed. And of course you want to develop the fines out of the formation and help that gravel pack to settle into place. A uh, little story I want to tell you on, on this one. The, uh, the test you see here, that was actually 3,000 gallons a minute that we were testing this, this well at. Yeah, I wasn't very impressed with that either. But what I was impressed with when we walked up to this project is the uh, V12 twin turbo diesel engine that was running full bore to try to keep up with 3,000 gallons a minute. Well development, what's pictured here in the middle is a, it's a laboratory test obviously, and it's naturally developed. So you'll see there is no gravel pack here, but what it represents is ideally what you, how you want to do, how you want a well to, to look like when it is developed. You can see it's developed out in, the, in these areas. A lot, of the, a lot of the fines that are in the, in the formation, that's what, you want to, that, that's what you want to accomplish in the, in the development of your well. Over here on the far right uh, actually is a jetting tool that, that uh, we used in a, in a drawing to actually show, show a contractor this is what we want to see. Now we will typically use two or three of these methods in, devel in, in developing wells. Test pumping, after, you, after you've developed that well, you want to stick a test pump in there. You don't want to stick a permanent pump in. You want to stick a test pump in there because this can be pumping sands and that kind of stuff. So you want to destroy that pump, not the new pump you're going to put in. Uh, so you want it to be variable speed. Uh, you want to test over a series of, uh, of ranges uh, in, in gallons per minute. Uh, and we want to put a, uh, a, sand, a sand indicator on there. The one that's pictured here is a Rossum uh, sand indicator. And you can see in the bottom of this vial here how much sand it, it accumulated over some period of time. You can actually measure that over, over a period of time to, to determine how much sand that well will produce. It's a good planning tool. Plus it can tell you, did you develop that well good enough? It could also tell you you got a wrong design and it's just gonna pump sand forever. <laughs> so that's a good thing to do that. And then of course the final outcome of that is actually to, to, to determine the capacity of that well based on that step test that you did uh, in, with, those different, with those different flow rates. This is an actual well in, 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 in this area and what we did is to prepare a regression curve. It's a rudimentary way of predicting what that well might do over time. You can see in the, in the bottom line right here, we, go, we went clear out to 10 years on this particular well. And the actual data that was used to develop the curve is way back over here, but it looks like this if you blew it up. So basically what we're doing is emulating that curve out over time to see what that well will do. And this is actually all drawdowns. You can see it drew, drew down 20, 25, 26 feet, something like that, over 10 years. Uh, so this goes to show we, we didn't try to over pump this particular well, and we show that over that, over that amount of time, it can perform fairly well. Next, you're gonna look at wellhead configurations. These are three examples of, of what that can look like. 
uh, the one on the far left uh, is probably the simplest, least expensive way to take care of it. The reason you see a cage around the well, this is a, this is a submersible well uh, or a submersible pump, uh, this is to satisfy TCQ's requirement at, at the time this well was done. Uh, the second one is a little unusual. We actually put the uh, well house over the entire well uh, to, fu to fully protect it. Uh, this one uh, actually pumped directly into this city system. So it, it, it pumped it in directly to the distribution system. And because of that, of course, this water was, was potable coming out of the ground, we actually chlorinated it, and that's what this white building is. No, it's not a closet. That's where you, that's where you ha had, to ha had to house the uh, chlorination system. They actually used gas chlorine there. Um, that can be very lethal if you're, if you're not careful. Uh, the, the third one is basically bulletproof, and we put that to the test. Remember, we first used these probably about 15 years ago. Uh, shortly after hunting season, we, were, we had go gone out to the, to the whale field just to check some things out. Someone had uh, tried to see what they could do with their uh, shotgun on the side of the, the wall on this thing. Well, this is precast concrete, so I dare say the guy got a rebound like he never expected. Probably didn't try to shoot one again, I dare say. Uh, well head configuration, this is a typical piping system that you, that you would see for most any well. No, it wouldn't be that big, obviously, but, uh, but you're going to have a, a flow meter, a check valve, a isolation valve of some sort. This is a, a submersible pumping unit, that's why it's like that. Where you see the sand here, that's where this building was placed. Uh, when the, so the, in this particular case, contractor built this to make sure everything fit, took this back apart, set the building, and then put all the piping back in. Pump selection. Uh, after you've gone, gone through all of this, you're going to want to determine what kind of what type of pump to use, uh, how big that pump needs to be. Uh, it can be uh, sensitive to casing size. Uh, I've seen on a few few rare occasions where a well actually came in much much better than what the owner wanted to see. That's all good news, but because of the casing size and the screen size, they weren't able to put a pump in there large enough in order to be able to take advantage of the capacity of that particular well. So you just need to be sensitive, you need to be, need to be uh, conscientious of, of what you're doing with that so that you can maximize the, the capacity of the well. Uh, noise consideration, if you're in the neighborhood, again, this is if, you're, if it's a municipal well, you want to be aware of that. So maybe submersible is the way you want to go. Uh, but by far, the, the, uh, the, the two that you see in this area are vertical turbine line shaft, and that's where you actually see the motor on top of the ground or submersibles where the motor and the pump is actually uh, submerged in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the well. What's pictured here on this trader is a submersible. You can see the shiny part right here is the motor, and this is the pump part, and obviously this is the cable. This is the installation of a vertical turbine pump. Uh, you can see on the, on the left side, this is the pump sticking up here in the air. Over here, you can see the other components. You got the pump still hanging up in the air, but you have the, the discharge head here and the motor here. This is, I think, a 150 horsepower uh, unit. And then you have the column pipe uh, here. The, the blue coverings on there aren't, uh, aren't artistic or anything like that. That's just to protect the threads uh, while they're in transit. And then in the middle here, you actually have the shaft itself and then an oil tube. Uh, the shaft itself basically is a line shaft, or is a, is a drive shaft like you'd have under your car. It actually drives the, uh, the pump uh, and runs all the way to the surface and, and ties into the motor. Submersible installation, uh, there's a test here. Who can tell me what that is right there? It is not a baler. It is not a baler. <laughs> not a counterweight. Called out. Give that guy a hat. <laughs> he called it a flow sleeve. It's also, it's also called a shroud. A, electric, a, a submersible electric motor is happiest when it's cooled. So this uh, particular uh, device will actually fit over the motor, actually cover the intake of the pump, and force all water that's pumped by this, by this particular unit past the, past the motor so it keeps it cool. So you're actually using the pumped fluid to cool the, cool the motor. Uh, especially in the high horsepower motors like this, very, uh, it's very important to keep those motors cool. Here are some of the amenities that we add uh, to, to some wells. Uh, 
all submersible wells will have the uh, butterfly valve, check valve within the column pipe. The reason we do this is you don't want to have the column of water to fall whenever you shut the pump off. Because what'll happen, it'll, it'll, it'll turn that pump backwards. Worst thing that can happen is someone comes over there while that's turning backwards and hits the start button. You'll snap a shaft in a hurry. Uh, we also equip line shaft pumps with this. Obviously, you can't put that in the column pipe because you have a, you have a spinning drive shaft in there that you can't do that. But we'll actually install it on the suction end of the, uh, of the pump. So when it's pumping, the valve actually opens up because it's a butterfly. It actually opens up. Both of these will actually open, to, open together. Uh, but what it serves to do then when a line shaft goes off is it'll, it will check and, and slow that column from coming down so quickly. Uh, they're made to leak. But if you've, if, you've, if you've ever been around a line shaft that doesn't have one of these on there, you'll hear a ratcheting. And what it is, it's actually a ratchet trying to catch uh, that motor to stop it from turning backwards. So by putting one of these devices on there, it helps that issue. Another thing we use is the centralizers right here. As the name would imply, it keeps the pump and motor centralized in your casing. Uh, a lot of times when the well is drilled, especially if it's one drilled in a hurry, it may not be straight, may not be plumb, and what can happen in that case is the, the pump will actually could actually lay up against the, the screen. That's not a good thing because it can actually sit there and, and rub a hole in your screen and then you've got a potentially a failed well. So by putting in these very inexpensive devices, comparatively, uh, it, it, it uh, prevents that from happening. So without, the, so we have another, another prize we can give away? So who can tell me what movie this came from? Who said that? Right over there, we have a winner. <laughs> that is from Batman. Uh, it's, what's the name of it? The name? Night of, uh, dark, dark night, the dark, the dark night, yes. So what this is, is, is without pump efficiency, you sit back and watch your money burn. For those who didn't watch the movie, I'm guilty of that too. Uh, this is actually the, a, a bunch of money he's burning here. Uh, we always look, especially with the larger, larger uh, uh, pumps and motors, uh, you can expect uh, for line shaft to be in the high 90% range, 95 and above. Uh, typically, you can, you can expect 98. Uh, with submersibles, the best you can probably expect is in the low 90s. On the pump side, the very, very best is going to be in the low 80s. Uh, on the worst side, you can get down in the 60s. Well, if, you're, if, you, if you end up with pumping equipment that has very low efficiency, guess what? You're going to be paying that electric bill for the life of that equipment. So do the math. You're eventually going to, going to that efficient, the higher, higher efficiency, efficiencies are going to pay for themselves. So now you've got your pump in and your piping in. You need to maintain your pressure somehow. So in, in most uh, uh, residential in, uh, installations, you're going to see a, a bladder tank like this. Yes, this is the cutaway, which, so that you can actually see the bladder. And you're actually filling and draining this bladder. Uh, the second method is a hydromatic tank. I know that because it's written on the side of the tank. Uh, but it actually uses a little bit different method here, where you have a water-air uh, interface. With that particular system, you have to have an air compressor in order to keep, keep putting air into that tank. What happens is there is no bladder or mechanism that separates the water from the air, and the air will actually entrain itself over time into that water. So you have to continue to, continue to add, add water or add air to it. Uh, I'm a little bit proud of this one because this particular uh, uh, tank is a standpipe. It, it, it is the tallest one in the state of Texas of its kind. It's a pre-stressed, pre-cast concrete tank that actually resides in the city of Border. Uh, it actually had the, it, at one time it had the notoriety, it was the tallest in the United States, but the state of Minnesota, yes, I had to put that accent on there for you, uh, decided they need to have one that's about three more feet taller than this one, so now we can only, uh, now our only claim to fame is it's the tallest one in the state of Texas of its kind. Uh, but it's actually in service now, and this was actually a construction photo, and you can see here, this is the, the uh, uh, structural scaffolding they used to support the precast panels as they assembled those. And of course, we've all seen these in, throughout the state of Texas, uh, your typical elevated storage tank. This one in particular happens to be a million gallon tank. A lot of people don't understand too that pressure maintenance, especially with the, with the, with the tanks over here, uh, they're there for pressure maintenance only, for the most part. Yeah, you get some storage out of it too, but 
this one right here, a million gallon tank, the, the particular city this is in, uh, they can use 30 and 40 million gallons of water a day during their, during their peak flow. So you can see you could, you, could, you could flush that toilet in a hurry. I didn't have a good picture to put here, so I just put one of my own. I thought that was pretty cool. That's actually the city of Amarillo in the background. Uh, but aquifer pumping, what can happen? I'm going to have some animation here, so if you're... So what I'm showing here, we have a, a, a proper uh, producing well. This is in static uh, uh, mode here. We, we're going to animate this here in a minute. And on the right side is a overproduced well. So you can see on the, on the uh, properly producing well, you can see there's a cone of depression is what that's called whenever it, it does this. It's, it's not going very deep, and it kind of reaches out. That's what you want. On the other side, you can see an overproducing well. And basically, it's not an overproducing well. It's, an over, it's, it's, a, it's, a pumping, it's pumping equipment that's too large for the capacity of the well or the aquifer to produce that water. So you can see in that example that you have very steep cone of depression uh, and a very, very low uh, water uh, or, or pumping, pumping level. Your well's not going to be able to support that. I can guarantee you that. So let's look at that as if you'd applied that to a producing well field. Now I use the term well field loosely. It could be the, the, the patchwork of, of center pivots that are, that are in Hartley County or Carson County, or it could be a municipality's well field. So I, I use that term very loosely to apply to that. Here again, we look at the initial static water level. Here we've started to over pump that aquifer. So you can see here that the cones of depression are starting to interlink. That's not good. That's why there's spacing requirements. I want to put, put that plug in there for the districts. So if you shut those, those pumps off, then now, now you have your new static water level from what it once was. If you continue to produce that, that aquifer in that same, with those same pumping rates, now look what your, what your cones of depression have done. They not only interlink, but interlinked, but they've also lowered the whole water level between those wells. Now if you turn, the, turn those wells off, now you see what your new static, static, static water level would be is way down here. Now if you, if you apply this same theory to, say, some of the aquifers within the, within the panhandle that are 50 years old, or some of, the, some of the well fields that are over 50 years old, you actually see that, that exact condition. And like some of the presentations that were done earlier earlier today, uh, it's, it's not going to come back very soon. It's going to be millennium before it can come back. So in keeping with the uh, uh, theme of this, of, this, of this symposium, slow the flow, it's all we've got. And that's all I've got.